The first is Amber Reap, a senior research associate that serves as the project manager for several statewide national training program grants and research projects. She has extensive experience in transit operations, planning, safety, security, maintenance, and emergency management, as well as adult educational development theory, principles, assessment, and delivery. Ms. Reap has a Master's of Science in Educational Technology System Management from the State University of New York and a Bachelor of Science in Transportation Planning and Management from Gallen College. Bill Mayer uh, started his career at Votran in 1991 as a bus, bus operator. Since 1999, Bill has served as Operations Manager for both paratransit and fixed route services. During his leadership, he has assisted in the selection of, a, of simulator equipment and continued to monitor it, as well as all other operations training. And he is one of the partners in DOT's regional training facility located in Daytona. Rosemary Bosby is a native of Tallahassee, Florida, and has been employed by the city of Tallahassee for 17 years. Rosemary has served as a coach operator, dispatcher, acting superintendent, and is currently the training and safety specialist. She recently graduated with a BA in business administration and is currently enrolled in the transportation career management program at the Center for Urban Transportation Research. With those introductions, I'd like to turn it over to Amber Reap to begin this afternoon's presentation. Great. Thank you, Liz. Um, so this afternoon, um, our co-presenters wanted to present to you the results of a recently completed uh, National Center for Transit Research report um, entitled The Bus Operator Simulator Experience and Lessons Learned. Um, this was a joint partnership. Uh, the report and the research with the Florida Department of Transportation. Liz Stutz at FDOT was actually our project manager, and both myself, uh, Lisa Stays, and Victoria Perk actually performed the research and wrote the final report. And none of our work could have been complete without the case study participants that um, worked with us throughout the years to collect this simulator information, two of which have agreed to present with us today, and we're very grateful to them for that. So thank you both, Rosemary and Bill. Um, so as I mentioned, this project was um, both an FDOT and an NCTR project. It was a multi-year research project um, where we collected and followed transit agencies both within the state and also outside of the state who were going through the process of purchasing and implementing simulators into their training programs and their agencies. Um, we had three agencies within the state of Florida that we followed, and there were four agencies outside of the state of Florida um, that we also collected information for, uh, from. Um, so the data that we collected um, mostly dealt with incident or accident type data. We focused in on the type of accidents and incidents, the frequency, the date, the time, the location, just to name a few, uh, whether or not the incidents were preventable or non-preventable. We also collected training data, employee turnover data as it related to both the operators and the trainers themselves, and we also collected some general and other information which we'll be able to describe for you a little bit more throughout this presentation. Um, we also reviewed NTD, or National Transit Data, database data. Um, we used the SS-40 forms for major incidents to back up a lot of the information that was being reported to us. And from all of this information, we were able to identify some best or model practices, as well as lessons learned, and we'll be sharing those with you today. So just some background information about what a bus operator simulator is and what the environment kind of means for um, a trainer or an operator as they're using it. Um, the simulator is a 3D virtual world. It's a geospatial database model, if you will. It is a true facsimile of a full-sized fixed route or paratransit bus cab enclosure. Um, the similarities are amazing as you kind of go through the process of sitting in one. They are comprised of actual and representative parts and components, and those parts and components include a real bus operator seat, uh, radio, active steering wheels, seat belts, foot pedals, vehicle controls, transmissions, gauges, in indicators, and switches. It is a true facsimile, and they try to simulate the environment as closely as possible. 
So on the software side of the house, um, the environment that the operator sees um, as far as this line of sight is concerned and the angles required are also facsimiles and are accurately preserved for presentation for the operator as they go through the simulator. Um, so the simulator companies have done a good job at replicating both the physical and also software line of sight and angles of sight information that's required to truly represent a real life environment. The software itself is a Microsoft Windows based product um, and they have simulated driving surfaces that are customizable including various roadway and materials um, conditions, things like grass, gravel, dirt, sand, and traction all are challenges or changes or customized features within the simulator. And um, they also have integrated sound variations for each of these services, or each of these surfaces, excuse me, um, to replicate both dry and wet conditions, all of which we experience on the real, in the real world um, while we're driving, so it's important for them to be replicated in the simulator world as well. Weather is also something that's very customizable, and um, here in Florida, um, we certainly have lots of rain and fog, and for the northern states or the colder states, they also have uh, snow and ice conditions that can be replicated. Um, lighting conditions are also an important feature that is replicated in the simulator, including things like daytime driving, nighttime driving, uh, the most dangerous times to drive, dawn and dusk, and then important things like sun glare uh, that we typically experience both at sunset and sunrise. So the software itself actually works in tandem with the vehicle's cab to provide um, controlled, immediate performance-based feedback to the operator. So, for example, if a bus operator um, hits a hits an, an object, like, for example, a curb, there's actually a seismic-like feature within the cab that makes the simulator rock and roll, if you will, a little bit so that they can hear or and feel what's exactly happening to them. Um, the vehicle sounds, um, as far as ambient noises like weather, are also available. Um, pulsations and any kind of traditional sensations that you would have, see, hear, or feel in a regular transit vehicle are replicated as close as possible within the simulation environment. So our research itself focused on general training practices and standards at the transit agencies that we followed. Um, we also looked at agency-specific parameters for defining both preventable and non-preventable incidents. Um, we spent a great deal of time collecting information on employee turnover and retention rates when they were available to us. Um, any type of ridership changes or external items that may have affected some of the data we were collecting were certainly items that we focused in on. And a training structure of the departments as well as any kind of staffing issues that may have affected uh, the use of the simulator. And all of those things will be things that we discuss in our uh, case studies. So we're going to discuss today um, the Florida case studies. We have Star Metro. Um, Motran representatives here with us. I'm going to present to you a case study from Broward County Transit. Um, however, the report itself has case studies from other transit agencies um, that you're, are very interesting or very similar to the case studies that we are going to be talking about this afternoon. Um, so if you'd like a full copy of the uh, report itself, that's certainly available. But for today's presentation, because we only have an hour, we're only going to be doing or highlighting three case studies. So Star Metro was our first case study, um, although we did them all simultaneously, but it's the one we'll be discussing first today. Um, they actually began integration of their simulator training in December of 2010, and full integration of their simulator training program into their existing training program did not actually occur until May of 2012. Um, through this research and through following these transit agencies, it is actually very clear that the integration process of the simulators into uh, a traditional training program does take some time. So from 2010 to 2012, Star Metro was able to train 141 bus operators. 
And these are some statistics as it relates to Star Metro's bus operator training program. These are annual averages. We wanted to provide to you um, some estimate or some numbers, if you will, as it relates to totals for the type of training for new bus operators, any kind of post or accident incident operator training, and also remedial or fresher or refresher training. And in this case, in Star Metro's case, we see that um, the agency actually spreads out the simulation training and has it included in all three portions of the training process, new operator, incident, and accident, and also refresher training. Um, and their totals are on the far right-hand side of the screen. But this really gives you a good idea of how the simulators are being used, where they're being used, and how much time is incorporated into the simulation. Um, Star Metro's total accidents and incidents, as they reported to us, um, you'll notice that uh, during the process of integration for the simulators between 2010 and 2011, um, there was actually a bit of a jump or an increase in the number of accidents and incidents. And it's really important to, to note that there were a number of issues that were going on at that time, including the agency's restructurization and decentralization of their entire route structure. Um, so that can certainly account for a lot of the changes that we see in these numbers um, as we're moving forward. And I think as we go through this process of presentation today, you'll see that uh, numbers kind of jump up and down uh, as far as the accidents and incidents are concerned, but they are almost all associated with some peripheral incident that's happening at the agency, either major route changes or decentralization or any number of other things that, that are happening. And we'll be highlighting some of those as we go through this today. So. Um, Star Metro's major incidents, as reported from NTD, this table actually represents that information. Um, you'll notice that there isn't a, a lot of highlighted information as it necessarily relates to the simulator, um, but we really felt it necessary to include some of this NTD information um, just so that it would help be represented of total accidents and incidents, major incidents versus some of the minor ones that were represented in the slide before it. Um, so we actually have a representative from Star Metro today um, who has agreed to talk to us and share with us some of the challenges and lessons learned and benefits that they've gained through this process. Um, I'm kind of here to talk to you about the research, but I think that um, Liz and I both agree that the important piece of this presentation is really having an opportunity to learn from the agencies directly and hear what they have to say about their experiences. So um, from that point, I will hand it over to Rosemary. Good morning. Um, some of the challenges that Star Metro face with um, the simulator and our simulator program integrating it into training is, of course, the staff changes. We recently had our one of our training and safety specialists to resign, which left one trainer here. Um, we now have another trainer, uh, Mr. Worrell, however, trying to get him caught up to speed and also with dealing with our turnover here at Star Metro, it's kind of hard to continuously do the hiring, the training, recruitment, so on and so forth. So. Of course, that was a huge challenge, having someone else to come in and assist us with sim um, simulator training. The decentralization took a whole lot of focus away from us training our operators into now having to retrain our old operators with the route structure. All of our operators had to be retrained because the whole system changed and also dealing with the ridership increase. Uh, lessons learned, uh, more buy-in would have been appropriate. Uh, from a trainer's viewpoint, there are some things that we would have liked to have seen into the, going into the simulator training, but of course, um, we didn't have as much feedback as we would like to have had with, from the management staff. Um, spreading the training over for our trainers, spreading the training over a period of time kind of worked out to our advantage because now we're able to actually have them come back in and have Mr. Worrell trained up even more to learn more about the simulator training. And of course, we did use some of our supervisors um, for the training. 
benefits with simulator training is, of course, we can train multiple operators at the same time. We do not have to train them on the same sessions. So it saves as far as costs with accidents. It saves mileage on the buses, which is maintenance, and also saves in our fuel costs. Great, thank you, Rosemary. Um, so our next case study participant is Votran out of Volusia County in Daytona Beach, Florida. Um, what we see here is a picture of their regional training center, which, as Liz mentioned, was a collaborative effort uh, with the Florida Department of Transportation that was built in 2007. Housed within this complex is the simulator. Um, they actually had a rolling multi-year integration process very similar to um, Star Metro's simulator integration process. And over the years that they provided training, and of course they're still using the simulator, but um, they have trained 361 bus operators during the course of the research project um, and the information that we're representing here today is data. Votrans bus operator training, um, these are some annual averages for them. As you can see, um, they also incorporate the simulators into new bus operator training, post-accident and incident training, and also refresher and remedial training. Um, and they also, very similar to Star Metro, also provide classroom training and on-the-road training. And the totals for all of those training are provided to you um, on the far right-hand side of this table. The accidents and incidents by type that were reported through the course of the research effort by Votran, um, as you can see in this table, we have um, allocated or, or broken out um, accidents with other vehicles, fixed objects, uh, rear end collisions, and then the totals. You'll notice that there is um, kind of an up and down approach to much of their total accidents as well. Um, and uh, in 2011, um, you'll notice a, a spike in their accidents and incidents, and I am thinking, if I recall correctly, and Bill can certainly correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in 2011 they had a huge spike in their ridership, um, which certainly would have contributed to a lot of the number of um, increase in accidents that we see in 2011. So here's a table that represents uh, the NTD data as it relates to Votran's major incidents. Um, again, you'll see a number of these uh, numbers kind of jumping up and down. Um, it's truly a randomized effect, if you will, to um, the accidents, whether major or minor. So um, some of Votran's lessons learned, um, the challenges, the benefits, in their own words, uh, are shared with you here. And I will hand the presentation over to Bill. Thank you, Amber. Uh, training staff, we have one training person, and we do utilize uh, supervisors to assist with that. Uh, the turnover for operators is incredibly high, as anybody in this industry knows. Uh, we are continually on a hiring rampage uh, and can never get to the level we need to get to. In 2011, Amber, you're absolutely correct. We had a huge spike in ridership that just was uh, incredible. It's, it's good, but it caused us some issues. Uh, some of the things with the simulator, yes, there is some motion sickness involved, but most people you can get through the training with the simulator based on keeping the room cool, starting off slow and easy, keeping it dark. There are some little tricks that you get used to using uh, to help people get through that. There are a percentage that's probably more, no more than 3% or so that just can't do it. Uh, no matter what you try to do, they end up getting sick and you, you just can't get them through it. Uh, overall, you can get most people through. Uh, the lessons learned from us, or from me at least, is uh, when you do get to the point where you're going to purchase the simulator, use Rosemary's idea and spread your training out over a number of years. Because we did all of our training up front, and we have found that that was not a good idea. Uh, make sure that 
when you do purchase a simulator, you get someone to work with you from that company to help integrate it into your tra current training. Because we found that integrating that into your current training, if you're not, your specialty is not education, it is very difficult to figure out how to integrate that in. Uh, a good training department, something that's stable and sturdy, that you have the same people doing it all the time, is always best. The benefits is saving fuel, as Rosemary said, and multiple training of personnel, and a whole lot safer to do it on a machine than on a bus. <laughs> thank you, Bill. Um, yes, thank you. All right, so um, the next case study that we um, identified in the research um, was Broward County Transit. Um, Broward County Transit historically had been using simulators for many, many years. Some of the first generation simulators were, bo were born and bred, if you will, at Broward County Transit, and they had been using them for a very long time. Their program for simulator training was very comprehensive. Um, they have annual averages as well as it relates to um, some training. You'll see that um, for the most part, the simulators are used um, only in new bus operator training and post-accident training. However, um, at the present time or during the project, they were not being used for remedial or refresher training. And you'll see um, some zeros there, which we'll be kind of addressing um, um, probably in the next minute or so. Um, and also the totals for all of their annual averages for, for training, uh, both classroom, over the road, and simulator are provided for you on the left hand or right-hand side of the screen. Um, here are some of the Broward County accidents and incidents uh, broken down um, by preventable, um, as uh, represented here on the table between 2008 and 2012. And provided to you also is the National Transit Database information um, as it relates to their major incidents. And you'll kind of notice, as we've noticed on so many of the other case studies prior, that the numbers really kind of um, go up and down um, and don't have any normal consistency or, or standard um, identifiers as to um, benefits or decreases or increases for any particular reasons. So what were some of Broward County exper experiences? Um, they actually had a significant stash staffing issue of their training department during the entire process of our case study, um, during the study period, um, with really almost all of their trainers retiring either within a few months of each other or a few days of each other. So unfortunately, um, they experienced a loss of almost their entire training staff who had been for many years uh, the driving force behind their simulator training program. So while BCT hired new trainers, their focus was really on getting the um, training program back online um, as far as traditional classroom and over-the-road training was considered. But um, because there was such a backlog of training necessary, the simulators were not necessarily built in and didn't have perhaps the same um, consistency as previous years. So um, I wanted to provide to you uh, some of the lessons learned. This, this slide actually says VOTRAN, but it should say Broward County Transit in their own words. Um, some of their challenges included um, exactly what I had just mentioned, which was significant staffing issues as far as the migration of almost their entire staff into retirement, and then a new bi migration of training staff into their, um, into their new program. Um, lessons learned included things like management buy-in, um, training department and structures. Um, Broward, or Broward County Transit really um, serves as a, believes that simulators serve as an uh, intervention tool and that um, the simulators are really an ideal opportunity for operators to practice fundamental and complex driving skills. So while they certainly experienced some challenges um, during this study, um, they also truly believe in the benefits of it. The other case studies that we don't have time for today, but are certainly included in the final research report, which is also available in the handout section of today's live meeting, 
um, which is an uh, icon on the top right-hand corner of your screen that looks like three white pieces of paper. Um, those case studies included Houston Metro, um, MBTA or Boston, Champaign-Urbana, and also York Transit. Um, the only caveat that I'll add to this is that because uh, York Regional Transit is in Canada, we were not able to provide any kind of national transit database information in their case study, but I think that you'll find that their case studies are very similar to the Florida case studies and many of the lessons learned um, and benefits are very similar to those that we um, highlighted in the Florida case studies today. So just some information with regard to the statement of NTD limitations um, as it relates to the research project. The researchers, we used NTD safety and security data in uh, 40 form for major incidents, but that really only captures some of the major incidents like fatalities, um, injuries that require immediate medical assistance away from the scene, um, property damage, and also um, evacuation due to uh, life safety reasons. So while this data is certainly important and helped us in a great deal with the research report and identifying any types of trends that we might see, um, the data is limited by the fact that um, the requirement of reporting for it is um, those items which we've highlighted on this slide. So what are the qualitative benefits? Um, while the agencies certainly experienced their own individual um, issues, we've really f seen that all of the agencies in the case studies have really been steadfast in their acceptance of the simulators as a valuable supplemental training tool. They've really all felt that um, it helps to acquire and practice and develop skills. Um, and also it helps with the rehearsal of improving reactions to situations and also allowing the trainer to talk to an operator about a specific incident um, in a simulated safe environment. It also helps to improve decision-making skills for bus operators and allows for a two-way communication street between the operator and the uh, trainer, as well as um, if you're teaching a, a multiple operator class, operators can aid and help each other as well. Um, the review of learning experiences with the benefit of replay. The simulators have the ability to record um, the simulated environment, so a trainer can record a bus operator and then play that recording back to the operator so that they can see exactly what went wrong, what went right, and allows for a two-way communication of um, ways to improve or things that can be done differently. And again, this, this whole process of what we've just described with regard to replay and uh, an open line of communication really just helps with the reflection of the training experience. It allows the operator to reflect on what just happened, how they think they can do something differently, and can really highlight some of the key important things that may or may not be missed in the um, hustle and bustle of, of the real environment of, of driving a vehicle. So what are some of the considerations or, or lessons learned based on the research that we've conducted? Um, we've really learned, and Bill kind of highlighted it for us, that there needs to be some practice for improving employee retention rates um, and succession planning for trainers. And, and really what we mean by that is that uh, the agencies in the case studies really spent a lot of time and effort and resources training their bus operators, and with the operator uh, retention rate being so low and turnover being so high, they really saw a lot of their resources go out the door, almost literally. Um, so as they're investing in these operators, um, they're not sticking around, so that's unfortunately lost, um, lost investment, if you will. And also succession planning for the trainers. I think Rosemary highlighted this, and this is what happened in the Broward, Ca Broward County case study as well. Um, there needs to be some uh, succession planning with regard to trainers to have more than one trainer available um, and be an expert in simulators. And also, as Rosemary highlighted, perhaps also incorporating some other staff, including supervisors who can fit, who can sit in and serve as, as trainers and or help in case um, anyone retires or isn't there or there is an influx of new operators. So um, additionally, we also identified that um, because 
integration of the simulators really took so much amount of time. It's important for transit agencies to identify integration practices before they go through the process of purchasing and, and, and um, installment. Um, the integration process is one of those things that took a year, if not longer, for most of the agencies. And having that practice or plan in place is certainly something that's going to be valuable in helping the agency utilize the simulator in a more effective and timely manner. And um, we're going to be talking a little bit, of, little bit more about that integration practice as we go through the presentation. Also, um, general training practices and standard recommendations. As you saw, all the case study participants used the simulator differently. Um, they integrated it differently. The number of hours that they used was different. Um, it would be fantastic if there were some standardized training recommendations that were made either by the industry um, or an industry association um, as it relates to how the simulator should be used and for how long and when. Um, that's something that certainly would be helpful. Practices and standards um, of the collection of performance-related data. Um, a lot of the information that we received um, really depend, uh, depended upon the agency who was submitting it to us. Um, and having some of that standardized information collected at every agency um, and have that information all be represented the same way is certainly important in identifying any type of quantitative um, benefits of simulators as they perhaps relate to accidents and incidents. Um, and also um, recommended preventable and non-preventable incident definitions as a standard would certainly be a helpful thing. As you saw from the case studies, there were um, variations in the, in the definition or um, description of what the agency defined as either preventable or non-preventable. So while we may have seen an increase in, in um, preventable or non-preventable incidents or even a decrease, those definitions were really dependent on the agency itself. Um, again, I'll mention, though, that all of those specific definitions are actually included in the report itself, so you're, you're more than welcome to kind of drill down and identify what those uh, definitions were for each of those agencies. Also, one of the other lessons learned is that um, it perhaps is important to have, have a prevailing training department structure and staffing model that is um, important for practices and continuity planning. Um, again, this forward-thinking approach to planning for everything um, certainly became very prevalent as we went through this process of following these agencies as they integrated it, as they saw things like route changes, um, staffing changes, department changes, and even management changes. So continuity planning is certainly something that we thought was um, an important lesson learned for the agencies. And finally, it's, it's evident that Comprehensive procurement plans um, are, are available and are very much um, perfected, if you will, in the um, purchase and procurement of simulators. But the technology integration plan and continuity plan are really fundamental and really critical components of the simulator training program. And they need to be incorporated as minimum elements by transit agencies when purchasing these simulators. They help the agency plan, measure, improve, identify, enhance, and, and realize the true benefits of the simulator and be able to track that information and report it accordingly. Um, so those are two important elements. And within the report itself, we identified a technology integration model or plan um, that the agencies can certainly incorporate. It's, it's called a TIP model, and essentially it helps the agency lay out the phases of integration, um, from the first phase to determining the um, relative advantage of, of the simulator to defining the objectives that the agency wants to have. Each agency um, perhaps could have different objectives for the simulator, so it's important for those objectives to be identified early so that they can be incorporated and measured later on um, in, in the later phases of, of um, the planning process. Phase three, um, the design and integration strategies are certainly important, having management buy-in, having department buy-in, um, having departments and staff talk to each other and work together. Phase four, um, the prepare to prepare an instructional environment. Um, it's not necessarily a, an effective tool when the simulator is, is 
you know, installed in the agency and the manufacturer comes and provides their training. And when they leave, the trainer's kind of left thinking, well, what's next? How do I incorporate this? Um, how important is this to the agency? So those instructional environments are certainly important in identifying um, in this phase. And then phase five, um, the ability to evaluate and, and revise the integration strategies is important. This is going to be a moving process or a live process as the agency envelops this uh, simulator training into their program. So there needs to be some amount of, of movement, if you will, for the agency to make changes to their integration strategy, to, to revise it, to reevaluate it. And these are all just important considerations as they go through this process. So um, with that, I'm actually going to conclude the formal portion of the presentation and hand um, the presentation back over to Liz. Thank you, Amber. And thank you, Amber, Bill, and Rosemary for uh, your comments this afternoon. We've got some questions from the audience. And uh, I'll start with the first question. Bill, you mentioned some tips. The question to you guys is, how do you come overcome issues of motion sickness while using the simulators? And Bill, you had some tips on that? Yes. Uh, we've always learned that if you can keep it semi-dark in the room and cool, that helps. Uh, start out slow with with exercises that keep the driver going in a straight line, no sharp or hard turns, and then you can slowly work up to the real city driving and things like that. Uh, we've tried the motion sick bracelets uh, and all kinds of things, but keeping the room darker and cool and taking it easy, not rushing them into a very hard exercise right away has always seemed to work best. Thank you, Bill. And as a follow-up question, uh, besides motion sickness, are there other, any other issues that the operators experience while using the simulators? Uh, at Votran, we haven't found anything other than the motion sickness. And it's, like I said, the percentage of people who get really sick and can't do it is pretty low. Uh, I don't think there's any other issues why someone would not be able to do it, or at least we have not accepted them. Let me put it that way. <laughs> Rosemary, do you have anything to add to that? Your operators experience any other issues besides motion sickness? No. Um, as Bill stated, we haven't heard of any or ran into any. Um, the only one is the motion sickness. And we typically find that in our... Um, older operators than in the younger ones. We have some that are around in the 20-ish age group, and they do very well. Um, once you start getting on up into the age, then, yeah, you have more that cannot tolerate the um, simulators. That's interesting, Rosemary. It makes it sound like we perhaps need to fund another study to find out if the video game generation has better luck with simulator training than my generation. But uh, anyway, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, do the drivers feel like they are better drivers as a result of the simulator? I don't know. Um, if you... oh, go ahead, Rosemary. I'm sorry. That's okay. Go ahead, Bill. I don't know if they really feel they're better. I think it makes them feel slightly more confident, particularly for the people who have never driven a large vehicle. I think it gives them some kind of confidence, uh, just enough confidence to help them be successful, I believe. Rosemary? And with ours, a lot of it is accident prevention or avoidance. Um, and what we have found is, is we actually did some remedial training in the simulators along with a little classroom training for some of the operators that were in danger of losing their jobs due to accidents. And it actually did save a couple of jobs. So it kind of, in a way, yes, it kind of boosts their uh, morale and confidence level in them being able to avoid accidents. Thank you, panel. Um, our next question 
is what is the main piece of advice you would give to an agency that is g considering a purchase of a simulator? Uh, feedback, buy-in from your trainers. Um, staffing, definitely um, you're going to need extra staff just in case your trainers are not available for the simulator training. But those are two key things that I think would help. I would agree with that, Rosemary. But I would also, from my end of the world, I would say that uh, ensure that you have ongoing, ongoing training from the company or the manufacturer of the simulator. Ensure that when you write your RFP and you set your contract, that they're going to help you integrate totally, not just a little bit, totally the simulator system into your training. I believe that in the long run, if you can do that, you will end up with a much, <coughs> excuse me, a much better employee, much safer, and probably with a whole lot more longevity in the job if you can make that happen. That's all. All right. Um, one of the questions from the audience is, do all of your operators have to use the simulator as part of the training program? Yes. Or at least make a yeah. strong effort. That 3%, uh, I'm not going to pay a worker's comp because I have to force them to use the simulator. But they have to make at least a strong attempt to use it. Rosemary? Uh, it's the same here at Star Metro, yes. We at least attempt to have them go through the simulator training. However, if they can't tolerate it, then no, we don't force it upon them. All right. And then on average, how much time do the operators spend in the simulator? Uh, it's about four hours for new employees. Uh, over the course of a year, if we do, for the people who do accidents, we do an ad additional um, training session. Uh, on our end, I don't believe that we utilize the from Votran, and it's my opinion, that we use the simulator to its full advantage. We have not been able to fully integrate that system into our training. Uh, and that's a shame. But someday I hope we get there. Um, ours is a little bit more only because um, like Bill stated earlier, it's really helpful for new operators that are coming in that really haven't had the experience of driving commercial vehicles. So we put them in there to get them familiar with our buses. It also kind of helps on training time when you're actually doing on-the-road training with the operators, but you don't have to spend as much time with them. So we do a little bit more. Um, here lately because of the staffing change. We haven't been able to reach that 20-hour mark, but when we first started the integration and the training, yes, we would do at least 20 hours. Okay, and another question from our attendees is, how much do the simulators cost? <laughs> Bill, I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> oh, thanks. But I'm going to refer this back to Ms. Stutz, because Ms. Stutz, you would know better than I. Ooh, well, that's, you know, our experience was, what, 2007? And back then, we were looking at a range from 250000 up to almost $500,000. Um, Amber, do you have any indication on what the cost is in today's dollars? Um, actually, those numbers are still pretty accurate. Um, I believe the 500 number has gone up on the higher end just slightly, but um, I believe the 250 lower end number is still pretty accurate. Okay. And now we have one final question for our panel. Very interesting question, and we'd like you to weigh in on it. The question is, is it something that could be used for teenagers that might interest them in a career in transit? I think so. Yes. I think so. Uh, so we do a little, excuse me. No, go ahead. Go ahead, and then I'll. Uh, we do a lot of things with the kids in the area, 
And uh, any time we bring a group of children into our facility and show them around, we always take them out and, and we show them the simulator and we let them practice on it and see what it's like. Aside from showing them that nice little video about careers in uh, transit, uh, which we think is pretty good, uh, I think it does interest some of them. I don't know if it would interest all of them, but I believe it may put a little bit of interest into some of them. Rosemary? I agree. Um, the same here. We have brought out different groups um, of young people, and when you take them into the simulator, they fall in love with it. Um, actually, we've had a couple of them that did state that they wanted to become operators. So, yes, I think it will, or it can. Well, with that, maybe we should look at uh, integrating it into some of our uh, community college training programs or such. It's it's an interesting idea, and I, I thank the audience attendee for that question. Well, that's all the questions we have for this afternoon. I would like to thank all of our panelists for their uh, time and presentations. Um, there is a survey for you to fill out in uh, regards to today's webcast. And with that, I will turn it over to Jennifer. Thanks, Liz. Uh, yes, there is an evaluation, so com please complete that. Uh, we'll be applying for um, the uh, AICP credit through the American Planning Association. So if you um, would like to receive uh, credit, um, then please indicate that in the evaluation. Uh, so thanks so much to our presenters for today, and thanks to Liz for moderating. I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks. Goodbye.